All right, folks, I think we're going to start in about a couple seconds. Um, a couple of guiding principles here. We are live streaming this. Uh, if there's any issues with quality sound, come to reach out to Mari on HipChat. Also, we are streaming the videos and presentations. Uh, quick sound check. Will, you able to hear me okay back there? Uh, good. We have an overflow room in Bronzeville, good. so if you're unable to fit in this room, it seems like we do have a little more room here. You go in Bronzeville, it's a little more comfortably. So. Cool. Well, again, thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, I think we're really excited for uh, the next installation of our hackathon series here. I think everyone remembers the last one we had was the uh, Amazon Echo with custom Alexa skills. I believe our Chicago local team, Foodles, was the winner both locally and nationally. Uh, this is just the next evolution of cross-practice, cross-office, uh, both competition and collaboration for some really cool stories to go tell our, our clients. Uh, quick thanks, uh, Cal Matoi, Director of Digital Solutions in Chicago, one of our judges, Justin Odemach, GM of Chicago Office, and then Mike Jorper, uh, Director of Cross-Market CRM. They are the three judges. Your fate is in their hands, so be nice to them. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Microsoft Alliance team for their support through this. Uh, they were the ones that funded the purchase of these devices. They're not cheap. They're roughly $3,000 a piece there, but they saw the value in strengthening the partnership with Microsoft, as well as engaging our amazing teams uh, to really do some great, amazing, and just frankly, incredible demos and just the stories behind them. So we're very excited, and thanks everyone for the interest and participation. We have six teams. It's going to be a fun day. Um, so the HoloLens, uh, what I'm holding in my hand here is the HoloLens device. It is a headset, full-fledged PC. It runs native Windows 10 applications. It also just so happens to project holograms into the space. Um, it really, it projects the screen and the images into your physical space, which is a key difference from what you'd say virtual reality or maybe a predecessor of Google Glass. You know, the, the term for this really is mixed reality because it overlays content into and around the space versus fully substituting like virtual reality or being a separate channel, as we jokingly call real reality, with digital experiences like mobile apps and websites. So it fits in that spectrum between the two, marrying the physical world you're in and the space with you know, the full creative license of a digital creator. Um, so I'm not sure many people are aware of the, the full story of the HoloLens. So back in 2012, uh, Jeff Northcutt, a CSL from Slalom, Seattle, led a team under a very, very heavy NDA with Microsoft to do the, uh, the business case, the customer segmentation, the pricing model, the sourcing, the strategy, the marketing, communications, everything behind the scenes to make a crazy idea come to life in this physical device we hold today. You know, fast forwarding two years, um, the device was announced in June 2015 as not just a rumor, but a real product that's coming to life. Uh, Slalom applied to the early adopter program. We were accepted in Q4 2015. We bought the devices in June 2016, and they've been rotating around the country to our six offices and delivery centers ever since, you know, roughly two to three weeks at a time. You know, getting our engineers and designers and our business strategists and our experience designers a chance to really get comfortable and you know, put together some of these amazing concepts you'll see today. Um, if we go to the next slide here, uh, really this comes down to hackathons are not just a science project. You know, hackathons are an exercise in curiosity, creativity, pushing the edge of the possible, but keeping in mind the business applicability of what we learn. You know, we did this with all state insurance with virtual reality, understanding how to help claims adjusters better learn and engage with their customers and be more effective. The same principles apply here. These aren't just games, they're not just fun, they're not entertainment. You learn, you engage, because ultimately learning and, and games and entertainment are very close cousins these days. Um, so I'll turn it over to Tony to talk specifically about this hackathon. But again, thanks everyone for being here. It's going to be an amazing 90 minutes, and I'm really proud of everything I've done. Tony? Yeah. So, as uh, Kelsey mentioned, this hackathon's been around, or this hackathon originated a while back. Um, this is the fourth instance of the hackathon that we've had here. It's going to turn around. Um, the fourth instance of the hackathon that we've produced, uh, the first one being the Oculus, then we had uh, IoT, and then we also had the Amazon one before. So we've been further branching and branching further out and actually bringing more complicated hardware into the mix. So what do we want to produce these Holland applications? Um, bridging concept and reality between what people on the floor want to try to produce 
and then also to try to share with people on the floor uh, and hopefully some business folks can try to latch onto that and see what we can produce for, for clients. So, um, so Seattle went last week. Uh, I saw the presentations. I'm super excited to see what we have today. I've seen already a few videos. I've also seen some uh, of the presentations themselves. So I think you guys will really enjoy this. Uh, I'm not sure if I can add really much more here. We're also on a tight schedule. So getting people up here, presenting, and then also any fielding questions. Um, we can just get underway. So right now our first group is the sous chef team. So they're going to come up here and stand. <laughs> Our team is very excited to be here this afternoon to introduce to you sous chef. How many individuals in this room would consider yourself a cook? And how many people with your hands raised wish that you were potentially a better cook? I think a lot of us. We have to cook every single day and sous chef is here to make that process easier, more fun, and more exciting. We're going to offer that sous chef really is a new way to think about your ultimate cooking companion. And cooking has changed a lot in the last 10 years. A lot of us are using technology more in the kitchen, whether it's to find the recipes that we're using, to actually learn how to cook. Our research showed that 59% of individuals between the ages of 15, or 25 and 34 are using a smartphone or a tablet in the kitchen. So we asked ourselves, what does that mean? And what we found is it means a lot of sticky fingers on electronics. It means a lot of loading and reloading different recipes. How many people have been sauteing garlic only to have you know, your recipe turn off? You try to hit, I see Andrea back there. It happens to me all the time. All of a sudden you're trying to enter in your new tablet to, to get back to your recipe, you're burning things, you've missed your timer, and it increases the stress to an already potentially <coughs> stressful situation. Maybe you decide we want to be learning more techniques, but now you're just adding another device with tutorials to start watching, and who even has the counter space for any of this? So we're going to invite you to see the kitchen in a whole new way. So sous chef is really taking the culinary process and bringing it to life. You're going to see in a minute a demo where you can search for your perfect recipe. You can exper uh, experiment with expert guidance. And really, you can start to master those cooking techniques. I'm going to just let you watch in awe as you see what I'm going to do.
and now I'm going to bring up Stacy Shell to talk a little bit more about specifically what we saw Susha able to do. So Susha <clears throat> will help you craft the right menu, access video tutorials to perfect your form, quickly scale your recipe. Did you ever have a dinner party where two people ended up showing up that you weren't expecting? This can help you scale that recipe up. Substitute ingredients to fit your dieting needs. And you can be the master of your kitchen, all without taking up counter space on your counter. So we see the evolution of sous chef evolving to accessing your recipe from anywhere. Edit your recipes, make substitutions. Allow cross-platform <laughs> support and manage a multi-course meal with concurrent times. Eventually, you'll be able to use voice commands, so really fully hands-off cooking. And capture family recipes for generations to come. Let your kids see you cook, even when you're not around. And step-by-step -step instructions, or imagine having a hologram of Jamie Oliver in your kitchen showing you how to cook. Is that not enough information? Are you a numbers person? So look at these statistics. So meal, meal kit service segment is expected to grow three to five billion dollars over the next 10 years. That's Blue Apron, uh, Me's Meals, HelloFresh, Home Chef. If you ever do a search, you can find tons of these home cooked meals that you can cook at home through kits. And there's client opportunities as well. So U.S. Foods, um, I'm sorry, let me back up to some more statistics here. YouTube food channel subscription is up 280%. And venture capitalists invested $2.8 billion into food-related startups. So we see that there are some client opportunities here at Slalom. U.S. Foods, they actually do training for their um, sales reps on, you know, what type of cut of bacon do you need for certain situations? how to cook certain things. They have not just ingredients, but they actually have full-fledged meals, desserts. Hillshire Farm, Constellation, Anheuser-Busch, all of these clients could actually be partnered together. So having a client partnership with other clients, uh, maybe food and wine or food and beer partnerships of what goes well together. So our team is really passionate about sous chef, but to get there, it was not smooth sailing. So there were a couple lessons learned, and I'm going to turn that over to Alicia. Hi, my name is Alicia, and um, I'm the lead developer on this project. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about some of the things we learned, some of the technology we used to make this happen. Um, so the first thing that we learned is that developing an augmented reality app or a mixed reality app is an entirely different ballgame than developing something for you know, a device or your desktop. Um, there are lots of different ways to develop apps. We started out with Unity, and I spent a lot of time on Unity, figuring out that was not the right tool to use for this project. Um, we also went into this with a big vision of like having a plate of lasagna holographically rendered on your counter so that you could compare to it. As it turns out, um, it wasn't really achievable for this stage. It's really expensive and requires some special equipment to do, so we weren't able to do that. Um, but you know, we also learned that working on an all-woman team was super awesome. This is I've been in tech for over 10 years now, and I've never been on an even majority woman team. And so it was really cool to be able to try on different hats and, and not have that pressure of, of you know, a typical team makeup. Uh, so the tech stack that we used. Uh, since this is a Microsoft project, we went all in on the Microsoft technology. Um, I personally am a big fan of open source software. That's what I've, I've built my living around. Um, so I thought it was really cool that Microsoft was doing some stuff in the open, uh, open uh, source space. So we used Visual Studio 2015 Community. Um, we used, uh, can, you, can you hit that over one more? We, uh, we also used um, one of their open source frameworks, the all-in-one code framework. It's a Windows Presentation Foundation uh, framework. It also uses the universal Windows platform. So our application right now, as it stands, can run on any Windows 10 device, whether it's a phone, or whether it's your Surface, or a desktop machine. Um, 
So uh, we used uh, XAML and C Sharp as the code base there. Uh, we, we also used the um, Windows Presentation Foundation because not everybody on the team had a lot of technical knowledge. And it allows you to graphically build applications using vector graphics without having a lot of programming experience. So it allowed the less technical people to jump in and really do things right away. And it allowed people like me and Carlin to come in and you know, massage the code a little bit and get it to do really awesome stuff. Um, some of our challenges, as it turns out, um, the HoloLens emulator shuts off uh, Hyper-V, or uses Hyper-V, which means that you can't use other VMs. So I was on a client project that used VirtualBox, so I was having to go into my system settings and re-enable and disable Hyper-V. Took me a little while to figure out that was, go that was what was going on. Um, t Visual Studio and Windows kept updating for us. There was one weekend where I spent 10 hours updating my machine instead of doing actual hands-on <laughs> hands coding. That was painful for me. Um, the other thing, too, is that our machines that we were using are really not beefy enough to do this kind of technology. They kept crashing, so that was pretty frustrating as well. Um, and, you know, none of us were Microsoft developers. I'm a QA engineer by trade. It's been 15 years since I developed an application. And so there was a, definitely a little bit of a learning curve to get us to where we wanted to be. But that said, you know, the four of us that are here, we're really proud that we made it. Um, so I, like I said, I'm the lead developer. Carlin couldn't be with us today because she's in the middle of a move. And um, she also did some of the development. Uh, Amy right here, was she did business support and really put together our presentation. Stacy behind me was our product owner. She did a lot of research and also worked on the presentation. And we have a few honorary team members who helped us out. So if your name is up here, wave your hand, stand up. There are a few of you sprinkled around. You guys helped us come up with the idea. Um, they helped us test it a little bit, give feedback, and that sort of thing. So with that said, we're, uh, we're just starting our holographic culinary journey, and I hope you'd like to join us. Any questions? All right. Are you going to be expanding out to other platforms? What were you thinking of in terms of that? Uh, Windows support, uh, Windows 8 support would be good. Okay. So that uh, another thing would be maybe expanding into Android or OS 10. Um, the the code base that we made is pretty flexible and accessible. All right. Thank you guys. <laughs>
Uh, we also built in voice commands um, to kind of give a nice user experience. Mm -hmm. And you'll also see some more custom additions from our side. All the ghosts were kind of created in Blender. Um, they're all custom 3D models as well as the cherry uh, to have that as well for the fruit perspective. Um, to kind of kick off the game here, just want to give a quick shout out to the team. Uh, please vote for us. Um, other than that, <laughs> uh, uh, and notice all the dots will kind of pop up and generate around us. Um, that is our playing arena. Uh, those are procedurally generated dots. We kind of estimate the size of the plane and then we generate based upon that. Uh, just like Pac-Man, hit the big dot, ghosts turn blue. You collect the ghosts when they're blue. Uh, get more points. Um, we do have a separate API that powers our leaderboards. And what this allows us to do um, is actually uh, post out all of our scores outside of the HoloLens, and now everyone can kind of try and compete. Um, so we're going to wait for Unity to load up here. A um, couple other things to note, uh, you'll see the directional hours as I look away. Um, so here's our game, uh, kind of to describe the four personalities you see in front of you. The one coming towards me right now is Stinky, go straight line, follows the user in the sky. Uh, and the red is Blinky, uh, will follow the user uh, less aggressively and then kind of come behind you. Coming straight towards me on the left side is Pinky, who follows a kind of a low path, but aggressive path to come and find the user as well. Um, and finally, uh, you'll see uh, Pinky kind of revolving in a circle there, uh, so my face on it, and kind of hit the blue dot. Let's try and get some ghosts. So you can hit the ghosts, you can collect the dots, you can collect the cherry. So we actually are tracking depth as well. Uh, we put the cherry purposely to make people duck for it. Um, you can see my score on the HUD in the top left. Uh, we have brief instructions in the middle. Um, on the top right is my lives remaining. So we have three lives right now. So we powered the directional hours by knowing where is the user looking. And by spatial mapping, we know where they are relative to the ghost. So we can point out, hey, there's a ghost behind you. Um, you can also hear the sound on my left. All the ghosts are to my left. Uh, versus being on the right when it's all the ghosts are on my right. A um, couple other things to note, uh, we obviously do have some game over logic here, so I'm going to kind of purposely die. Um, just to show off a couple other things, uh, pause, pause, so we can kind of freeze the game mid-state for explanations or anything like this. Resume, resume, so that everyone gets back and going again. Um, just died right there, ran right into the ghost. Um, you can see our leaderboards on the top right. I've been playing quite a lot tonight, so you can kind of see all the scores are mostly mine right now. Um, thank you guys for watching. We hope you get a chance to try out today. Play again. So you'll probably notice that was filmed right here yesterday, actually. <laughs> so I totally prepared, I promise you. That's one cut, one video. So that's straight off the HoloLens. We encourage anyone to try it out. Um, and what we were able to do, so that didn't come together in a day. It took us a couple weeks. Um, we started a little late. I'll be the first one to admit that. Um, we tried to come up with this idea a couple months ago, and then we all got stuck up in projects. So then we came back to this like three or four weeks ago. Um, they kind of built it in three separate distributed parts. So each of us did a different chunk. Scarily enough, I was also coding, which those who know me is probably not a good idea, but either way, these guys kept my cool. So that said, we kind of started, this wasn't even our MVP, but we, we got the HoloLens. We didn't were built with it before. So our first thing to do was, what should we build? Um, a lot of us went through the Holographic Academy. For those who don't know, Microsoft put out like 25 interactive courses with walkthroughs, code, everything. Um, prefabs are in there, which is a huge part of why we were successful. So we were able to pull from what the open source community had already done and then expand significantly upon it. And we're hoping to give back to that too, um, following our project from what we learned. So first thing to do was generate where the dots were. Um, that took more logic than we would like to admit and then figure out where is the user, right? So spatial mapping, where are you in the plane? What we did was layer on all the other things to kind of bring the rest of the experience up to par. So where's the user looking? That's where we got the directional arrows from. Um, obviously the ghosts themselves had to be created from scratch. Uh, the AI scripting, we do use a parent script that controls like motion, how much they're angling, how fast they go. And we kind of modify that to make each ghost a little bit unique. Um, spatial sound, it's a lot better when you actually hear it on the HoloLens, but they get louder as they get closer to you and it's behind you or in front of you, it'll change based upon that. Um, and what we were able to do was add more stuff to this, right? Of course, like any project, we went and added voice. We added a HUD system to be able to track live scoring and the leaderboards, which I'll show in a moment, and game states. Uh, we built this all in a single scene, which is quite difficult to do in Unity. Um, so it required a lot of kind of game state management, and we have probably six or seven scripts that only manage what are you doing right now in the game, and those all tie together. Um, finally, uh, kind of hard to read in the red, but what we actually didn't quite get to. We got to leaderboards, which was awesome. We're hoping to kind of build towards more user profiles so you can actually write your name into the scoring. 
Um, multiplayer would be awesome. We know how to do it, we just didn't have time to do it. So imagine you're a ghost and you're a Pac-Man, you can play against each other um, and test coverage. Like any other project, we really need to improve performance a little bit. You saw the frame rate was a little choppy at times. Um, we've got miles to fix that in the last week, but uh, we still need to do that. In case you're wondering why I drew this ridiculous graphic, I have my reasons. Yeah. So this is clearly our project. Uh, we're really passionate about some of the things. Um, and I'm really happy to note that I probably should have made an extra couple boxes to the right here. We got through actually a little bit beyond that yellow box there. Um, so we started right a POC. How do we use the HoloLens in a way that's unique? Um, and we kind of went down the checklist. Uh, we kind of said, okay, we got to add in where is the user? We got to add voice commands. We got to add in kind of where they're looking. We did a lot of custom 3D room scanning. So we built it off the emulators entirely. Like we never used the device until this week, which was interesting on Monday to deploy it to. Uh, but that presented its own challenges. We got around that by actually scanned my entire apartment and there's a scan of this floor too. Um, and I'll show off what that model looks like, but you can basically plug that into the emulator and build off that, which is a real space. And we can actually connect all of our emulators together in a way uh, by doing it that way. Um, from there, we kind of went and added in all that other stuff you saw. So all the scoring, the titles, the stuff that runs in the background. And then finally, this week really was that third yellow box where uh, the last piece we haven't cracked, we're about halfway there, is kind of mapping a room and only putting dots where you can actually hit them. Um, so those of you who've tried the demo, I'm sure you've noticed a dot or two being outside the building. You can't quite get those. So we're trying to make that come in a little bit more, but we did get leaderboards. We got all the ghosts. We got the paw states. We have the cherry as well. Uh, and that took uh, a lot of time for us to get in there. There's actually difficulty too, which I didn't make out here. You can yell to make the ghost go twice as fast, which promise me it's way too difficult. But if you want to, you can try it. It does work. Um, and that's kind of how we got here. And what we're hoping to do from here is instant replay was something that'd be cool to us. You just saw my video filmed off of there. There's an API to access and pull those off the device. Um, so we're hoping to extend our leaderboards API to do more instant replays, um, put up maybe a web page so you guys can compete against each other and see, you know, how did that person really only get 10 points or how did they get a thousand, right? Um, and those are high and low scores, obviously. So um, other than that, uh, we love our designs, but there's always more things. We can generate walls and mazes and things like that. So kind of looking forward, that's kind of what's next for Hackman. And finally, uh, a little bit about the architecture. So none of us are Microsoft people either, which I think you're going to hear a common theme uh, on this. So we picked C Sharp, uh, and kind of that was the flow. So that takes a long time to deploy through. It's one of our challenges that we had. Uh, we have probably 28. 30 scripts with maybe almost a thousand lines of code that we had to write across all the different functions and features and all the stuff that powers this experience. Um, we use Blender and the prefabs, like I mentioned, to generate all of our objects. And then on top of that, since we didn't have the device until this week, we were using the emulator the entire time. So that's my apartment, you know, look at my couches. So you can see like we scanned that room and we're able to kind of understand and play Pac-Man virtually through the emulator for a while. Um, our leaderboard is surprisingly complex to do for the APIs. Uh, that took us a long time to figure out, but we got it this week. It's working now. Um, you can kind of hit it. It's through AWS, our roadmaps to change it to Azure, but for now it's AWS because um, that's what we knew. Uh, and scores live, so that all tracks up from the HoloLens. And then finally, it all turns into the application, right? So as the game is running, we're constantly checking gaze, where you are in the room, the sound that's outputting back to your ears. Voice commands are always being listened to, and all that processing is done in real time, um, which just speaks to the power of uh, what you have on your hands for the device. And from there, um, quick slide, I'm not gonna read through this, but like I said, Pac-Man applies to a lot of different things and a lot of different clients, and you would never maybe think that at first glance, but as you start taking apart a little bit of the, pe the features on the left, any of those things can drive any other types of experiences, right? So you can do guided tours, you can do route planning, you can drive competition between users, um, the custom stuff we did in Blender is applicable anywhere, right? They're just model design. And all of those things enable you to think, I tried to orient this around the user so you know where they are, you know what they're looking at, you know what they might want to do. You can help them find what they're looking for. And people who haven't played it yet, you can make them play it through just something fun and inviting. I've probably convinced more than a few of you, just, hey, come try Pac-Man. Nobody really says no to that. So that's kind of part of where our reasoning came from. It's a very friendly way to kind of get introduced to the HoloLens and what it can do. Um, some sample clients, we pulled from a lot of stuff that we've worked on. Um, any of those clients could do any of these different things. Um, the Deer one's an interesting example. We actually tried to think very specifically through how can this apply. That HUD system concept of how do you get information that's close to you in kind of your extra gaze. You saw it with Sous Chef as well, just outside your viewpoint so it doesn't block anything you're doing. That's extremely powerful stuff that just doesn't exist on the market today. And with that, no project would be fun without some learning along the ways. I think most of our stress kind of came from the monstrous development pattern and 
they are his unforgiving, right? So holograms seem real until they're not, and then that becomes difficult to kind of orient back and forth. Um, I'm tired of the Waka Waka sound. I will not be playing Pac-Man for the next month, but if you guys want to, you're welcome to. And beyond that, you can kind of see, maybe this is just us, but we had trouble with hotkeys for a long time. We still don't know how to copy paste anymore because it's control versus command. Seems like a small point, but for a month it was really stressful. Um, and really, step outside your comfort zone is the other one to highlight. Like I said, I probably shouldn't be coding. That said, these guys helped me and now I'm better at it, right? And everyone stepped into a different role that they haven't worked in before um, for this project and that's what we were able to create something out there. Um, and that roadmap was made on day one and we kind of stuck to it the entire time. So with that, that's our team. Um, we got some extra help. Um, Alicia, I couldn't find you for our picture, but thank you to you and Andy for all your assistance this week um, for some of our projects. And yeah, and with that, I just want to share I captured some videos of you guys, well you probably weren't paying attention. Everyone plays this game a little differently. So, I'm not going to say who's best, but some people are better than others. But yeah, so thank you guys for your time. Uh, we're excited to try it out. It's working on one of the HoloLens, and uh, let me know if you guys have any questions. <laughs>
So our reason here was to actually create morphers from matrix. Of course, our virtual uh, teacher is not going to teach you how to like do master art arts, but he's going to teach you the art of the piano. So you can take a beginner piano player and transform into intermediate or an intermediate and, and into a prodigy or even further. Um, here you can see like our architecture of our project. Uh, of course, we have the HoloLens, which is the user interface. Uh, we have the server in which the keyboard connects to. And then we have the communication between the two. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, this framework and this architecture is quite complex with a lot of challenges and risks in each every part. So we had to split the team into two sub-teams, the front end and the back end. Uh, the HoloLens UI, uh, what we focused there Firstly, was create a virtual layout of a piano and place it on top of a real piano. Then we added some song selection settings menuing that quickly got replaced by voice commands so the user would not have to move his hand off the piano. And then uh, the most challenging part was to actually take the sequence of events that consist of the song uh, to actually moving 3D modules. Data transmission. Why did we need data transmission? Our vision was for the user to see a feedback for each press of the key of the piano he actually performs. Uh, unfortunately, the HoloLens device could not connect directly to the MIDI keyboard, so we needed the laptop to connect to the MIDI keyboard, read these input events, and transmit them to the HoloLens device. Uh, from here, I'm going to pass it on to Quarantine, and he's going to give you some details about the server. So, hey everybody, I'm Coco, and I'm going to talk to you about the server. So, the server has two responsibilities. First is to transform our input, which is MIDI files, into something readable by the HoloLens. Second is to um, monitor the keyboard and uh, send the keystroke to the HoloLens so it can do some checks with that. So, let's talk a little bit about the MIDI files. MIDI files is pretty complicated. There's a specification which doesn't give any architecture, so I'll try to stay simple. This is an example of a MIDI file for, um, for piano uh, sound, um, music. So the MIDI file basically is a list of events like touch this, uh, touch of the piano, and then a little bit later, release it. Or some other events like uh, change the tempo of the music. So <coughs> here, for example, for this one, we would have like, three tracks, one for the configuration events, one for the left hand, and one for the right hand. This is really the best uh, scenario that we could have. So from those events, what we wanted to have is something more like, uh, I want to know when is which touch uh, actually strike, and where, uh, how much time is going to last, and when, when it starts. So we associated the MIDI events two by two to, to know exactly this time span in which um, the note was leaving, and uh, when it was starting, and so on. And we generated a, a JSON-like file, which was pretty easy to use with the HoloLens. So for the challenges, um, for the UI part, the main challenge was that um, the field of view is pretty narrow and actually much smaller than the keyboard. So we have to stay with um, songs which are really centered in the middle of the keyboard. Another challenge was that transforming the touches uh, that we generated from the MIDI files into uh, some 3D object with a size and a velocity uh, involved a lot of math. And uh, you can actually see on the room over there, like the, the board is covered with math that we use for calculating that. For the data transmission side, the most uh, the challenge came from the fact that we had to handle multi-threading because the um, server was sending asynchronous events to the HoloLens, and this had to be done in a in a separate thread than the UN thread, than, than the UI thread. And uh, the HoloLens is running an older version of uh, .NET, so it was kind of difficult to find some code to to help doing that. Uh, another challenge for the data transmission side was that uh, the event, um, yeah, we had to enable uh, the internet communications uh, like somewhere in the project, and this was not documented anywhere, so it took us hours to figure out that we just had to check one box. And for the server side, the challenges came mostly from the fact that the library that we used um, was using a recent version of .NET, so we couldn't run it directly on the, on the HoloLens, and we had to do all of the files conversion, the MIDI files conversion into something for the HoloLens in the server, and we have to send that through the communication. Um, that says there was also the MIDI, the MIDI itself, the specification was pretty complicated, and the architectures that we found on the different MIDI files that we used were really completely different. Sometimes some of them didn't make sense at all, and we had to handle all of that. And last, 
MIDI is event-based, um, and we needed something which to, to be able to predict the future. Uh, so we had to deal with that, uh, and it was dead. Uh, from now, I'm going to give it to Andrew. Sure. So there's mainly two buckets that we need to kind of concentrate on to develop the product further, and we do need to build out some game mechanics, uh, multi-level uh, game scoring. We don't really have that yet. Uh, introduce that gamification framework where maybe we have badges and leaderboards that are shareable. Uh, ghost mode, so you can play against the system. Um, Multi-level uh, player co-op, so you can play online, that kind of stuff. And then keyboard-free uh, mode is a really interesting idea, whereby if you were a professional pianist, maybe you don't need to bring a keyboard with you anymore. You can use gloves or some other kind of surface. And some of the new software features, um, to overcome the limited angle of view that you get with the HoloLens, we're thinking about some peripheral, peripheral uh, indication ideas, so you can see where the next note's coming from. Um, our system is technically, I mean, potentially configurable to any keyboard, so we just need to come up with a way to adjust keyboards. We do that now, we just need to make a little wizard for it. And then the product should ship with some kind of uh, out of the box music library that's easy to add to and searchable. Um, so, but really, at a high level, the key accomplishments would be um, capabilities of teaching new skill, uh, transforming uh, a sequence of actions and events into actionable, tangible 3D objects, and then live data feeding from any server into a HoloLens. Um, some of the future applications, I mean, we could talk about some of the clients, John Deere for the agricultural side of it. Um, heavy equipment operators would be able to survey fields they're working on and understand what part they've seeded or uh, sprayed or if they need to change a load as they're doing it. Um, agronomists could be in a uh, realistic 3D space and see year over year yield in fields. Um, training and coaching, um, we're thinking about maybe a client like Echo where there's complicated problems where you have a defined uh, space like a, a shipping container and you need to pre-visualize what loads would look like. Um, with machine repair, if somebody's walking through a 737, you'd be able to see through the skin and see defective parts where they could be adjusted. Um, so again, anybody who has a, a predefined visual space, um, we need to introduce real-time new data. We can kind of simulate that for them. So that, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>
So let's take a look at the video. Uh, just as a warning, you may want to get up on your feet and start dancing, and that's okay. Um, <laughs> it's not playing though. Where's my gear? So Hollow Rainbow is a completely unique experience. Um, what it does is it brings the e-commerce experience into your home with you. Um, it makes the browsing of endless, like an endless data supply. You know <laughs> so basically the data for the patterns is, is potentially endless. Um, you can see the outcome in situ. You can see how the tiles work with your current fixtures, with your current paint jobs. Um, price estimation is instant. There's no more guesswork of like under ordering or over ordering. Um, it's basically a calculator, it's a measuring tape, it's the store, it's your interior designer all in one. So the, the HoloLens capabilities that we leveraged in order to make this experience happen were uh, voice recognition so that you could do more complex interactions without having to um, and introduce more objects into the view space. Uh, spatial mapping to figure out where your walls are, and then object placement in order to place kind of these fake walls in front of your real walls. And then also gesture recognition, so you can say, this is the wall I want to pick, and then put this tile onto that wall. Um, things we hope to do in the next version or iteration of this application are um, object occlusion. So right now, if there's like a table in front of your wall, and it looks like it's behind the wall instead of in front of your wall. Um, adding some flooring and ceiling options, adding uh, a little better mapping. Right now, you may not get walls where you would expect them, or you may get an extra wall where you wouldn't expect one. Um, we also would like to integrate with some real store um, in order to pull prices and textures and um, be able to kind of generate an order that we could send off back to that store as well as uh, generate some pre-designed room kits so you get your wall and your tile and your ceiling all kind of curated for you. So who's going to use this? Um, families who are ignoring their children because they're spending so much time <laughs> remodeling their homes. <laughs> Contractors with big jobs, small jobs, everything in between, and interior designers that need to create visual renderings for their clients. Um, some of our client opportunities would be Home Devo, obviously, to kind of integrate with their e-commerce experience. 
um, possibly Hyatt or GGP with their re retail properties, maybe Hyatt's redesigning all of their bathrooms in their hotel chains. Um, maybe GGP is going through a redesign as well in some of their premier outlet stores. Um, some of the challenges that we faced versus um, in designing for augmented reality versus standard, um, some of the traditional kind of interfaces and menus didn't really apply. So you don't have a hamburger menu, for example, it doesn't apply. Um, you have to use, you can use your voice for interactions. It's not just taps and clicks, it's gestures, it's voice, it's gaze, it's, it's wherever the environment is also um, not stuck to a static screen, it's wherever the viewer is looking. So if it's harder to guide the interactions and flows for the user, um, and just learn patterns and behaviors just really didn't apply always. So in terms of how we built the application, um, we went from you know knowing nothing about HoloLens to having a, an MVP out. We started with the tutorials that Microsoft provided on the Hollow Academy site. And then from there, uh, we leveraged what they provided with the Holo Toolkit, it's a lot of open source kind of uh, wrappers around the HoloLens API. From there, um, we did all the development on the emulator at first, and then when we finally got a uh, piece of hardware to deploy on, we had to rework some things, but uh, had enough time to make it work on that. Um, from there, we, you know, our process was to build iteratively where we would uh, write some code, deploy it, see what works, see what didn't, uh, tweak it, and repeat. Uh, some of the kind of hurdles that we had to overcome included um, having to be able to provide rich functionality within this limited new kind of space. Um, so you know, we didn't want to clutter the new space with a whole lot of text or, or menus or anything, so a lot of that got pushed onto using voice commands. And um, the static things are kind of hard and to, to make interesting in the HoloLens. So it's, if you've tried any of the apps, you'll know that there's like, it's always making you move your head around and kind of follow something. And that was something where, um, you know, the user's more in control of the space than you are. So you need to make sure that wherever the user's looking, you're making your app work instead of the other way around. Um, getting good mapping data was pretty tough at first, so we weren't really getting many wall, walls detected. So there's a lot of uh, not to overcome there and still more we can improve with that. And um, in terms of what's how it looks in the emulator versus the device, what we didn't realize is the field of view on the emulator is way bigger than on the physical device. So it looked good on the emulator and we finally got a device. We realized like you couldn't really see what was going on. And so we have to rework a lot there. So if you're trying to build something for HoloLens, try to deploy on the hardware as early as possible. <laughs> Any questions? I think we're out of time. Thank you. Uh, yeah, up next, we got the uh, shimmer board or shuffle. Board, or there's a few fun. different names that have been tossed around. So let's, let's all forget shimmerboard. Shimmerboard, shuffleboard, that's the one. So don't say shim, shimmerboard again, okay? Don't say it again. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so so what am I gonna do here? Turn it on. Okay. If you want it on. Okay. Otherwise, it's all you can get the times. So. I have no idea what I'm doing here. Start up. But that's not my deck. What? You have a deck? What's that show? Oh, this deck. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Is that as uh, full screen as we're going to get? No, it's it's oh, a presentation uh, icon. This guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so we're. we're oh. Shuffle board at slalom. You guys get the logo? It's in the middle of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Microsoft's in there somewhere. We don't know. Shuffle A, shuffle board, and slalom, though. Um, I need my notes. Here we go. Um, I'm Will Capolero. What's up? Okay. Liz Composto. 
Ashley Baker. These guys got recruited on day two of their time at Spalm. <laughs> we are three designers, um, so we did not really engage uh, any engineering help or do any engineering or testing with HoloLens ourselves. Um, but we had some design conversations and thought about uh, the art of the possible with all the shuffleboard tables that we have at Spalm that we have shoved in many corners and don't get used a lot. Um, for our next conversation, I'd like to gather some data. So if you bear with me for a second. Can I get everybody's hands up? And I'm going to ask you a few questions. Hands up, everybody. We're going to, I'm going to do some hands up stuff. OK. Who's played shuffleboard? Keep your hands up. OK, a lot of people. Who's played shuffleboard at Slalom? OK, a couple of those are going down. How many people have finished a game of shuffleboard at Slalom? Okay. So there's some opportunities there. Um, opportunities for people to learn to confidently play, um, play shuffleboard, know how to play, know how to get someone else involved in play. Um, and we have them everywhere, so why not make use of them? Um, so what we did, we had design talks, we consulted with engineers, um, and uh, I was on one of the other uh, hackathon teams, so I learned from that experience. So we didn't build or test anything concrete, and we didn't really define an end goal. Um, it's mostly something, something, shuffleboard slalom. <laughs> and uh, what could be cool about that? What, what, what areas are cool about that? Next. So we thought about this, um, like exploring two routes to two POCs. Um, so one would be um, the single, uh, yeah, single table, single uh, hollow lens. What can we do with that to help two people play or two uh, two on two play? Um, so we can do tutorial or overlays of scoring, uh, other things to help this build the early part of the learning curve so people can confidently play. The other kind of POC exploration was about two remote tables. So Seattle and Chicago, or 51 and 53 playing together, um, using the HoloLens to be connected, um, possibly playing shuffleboard, possibly just using the table for kind of free play. So let's look at what we kind of thought of with the, the first group of concepts. So this is single table, single HoloLens, because that's what we have right now, right? Um, it got a little complicated trying to enable like, full learning of a game and kind of keep it simple for people. So we kind of thought through what would be, after doing a kind of complex version, which was really kind of complicated, what's the most simple way? So you basically map the table, um, you, look, you put a rectangle on the far half, um, so, so the, the HoloLens knows the table. And then you can put the, take the HoloLens off, put it away, and then you just kind of use it to uh, let's go to the next. Um, use it viewing the, the area where the pucks are. It can basically score score the table for you. So it would score based on what it can see. If it can't see a puck, it, it really doesn't need to know that a puck is out of view. It just scores what it sees. Because those pucks that have fallen off the table, they don't count for scoring anyways. So this has a red player that's got a three in the three zone, and then it's got a two. And that first blue, and if you guys want to know how to play shuffleboard and how to score it, um, the first opposite color basically means no more scoring for you after that. So we played with how do we display that for people. Um, we basically put that in a, I want more information on the left. You can go look over there and, and select that, and it, it basically tells you the details of scoring. But all you really need to know is score this current um, this current turn for me. And if you're playing doubles, you're, you're trying to get up to 50, uh, 21. If you're playing one versus one, you're trying to get up to 15. But we're not really getting involved in the game because this, this got complicated when the system kind of tried to interfere too much in the game or tried to teach kind of too much step by step, which is totally possible. But I think we wanted to kind of stay light. Um, so let's look at the other proof of concept. What if, just, what if we're just using the table for a shared um, kind of area between two places. So we do a lot of audiovisual chat at Slalom. What if we could use all these tables for kind of communal chat? Um, proof of concept could be just two people talking to each other. And so you rather get complicated with adding video into this or just seeing those, those two avatar photos. Um, maybe they pulse when audio is coming through. But you're just doing audio to audio chat. And 
we are not caring at all really about the game of shuffleboard. We're going to try and register the pucks um, to understand where they are. But we're going to leave it to the humans to kind of sort out the rules. If they're playing, if they're just shooting around, if they're playing, inventing a new game, or they're kind of using the pucks to talk about a project for some reason. We're not controlling that. We're not muddying that conversation. So we're just really making it shaft experience. And another next step for this could be HoloLens is really good at knowing where it's at, where it's where it's at in space. So you see these avatar photos are now like skewed into um, where they are in relation to the board. So that could be an interesting next step. May not be totally easy, but it is data that is that HoloLens is like really good at capturing. So if we can ex expose that, why not make use of that? And that could basically make this like virtual play experience more interesting. You could be setting a spotlight as to what you're looking at. Cool next steps for this could be when you snap and share a document that you just like place down uh, onto the, the uh, shuffleboard table, like an actual physical piece of paper or something from um, a shared drive. And then you, then people would, we think, really use this table for other things. And right now, it's basically used for like one thing, maybe. But if you look at any other like flat surface in Slamo, we totally take advantage of multipurposing everything. So no one puts their laptop on that. No one does a lot of things with that. And I think it's underutilized. OK, so what, uh, what are the challenges? What do we think the challenges are? So we talked to some engineers. And uh, actually seeing the pucks is going to be really hard with HoloLens, as they are now, um, as the HoloLens is now, and as the pucks are now. So we may not be able to see it, even if it's too small. Motion is probably not possible in the current state. So you're only going to be able to see it after it lands in a spot and stays there. So that's going to limit some of the experience. We may not be able to see color if HoloLens is seeing an infrared. Um, and then sort of getting involved in the game and tracking a game. That may be just complexity that we don't want to deal with in a proof of concept. Um, and then especially because that user interface layer becomes really complicated. Like we don't know or we do know where a buck is. That just to a user that can see a buck, they're not going to want to deal with that inaccuracy and kind of unknowns. So um, so that's like the biggest challenge. So we may have to get involved in like creating a QR code topped puck or interesting shaped pucks, um, which kind of changes the project a little bit. But if that's the, the way to approve concept, that may be like step one because you can't see the pucks. Another kind of easy, easier to way, easier to go route would be you're only dealing with virtual pucks, which HoloLens is, is really good at doing, especially with the two shared uh, two shared HoloLenses. They can definitely share where the virtual objects are a lot easier than mapping a physical space in real time. What are we doing next? Sorry. Okay, so I wanted to compare this to a few other products in the marketplace. So Rocket League is a great example of multiplayer, um, multiple platforms being used to bring people to come together around a really simple gameplay. So the, for those who don't know it, it's soccer with co soccer with cars. And the rules are basically, have, you got two minutes, get the ball in the other person's goal. There's no real complexity beyond that. And it's addictive in its simplicity. And shuffleboard could be too. Maybe we modify the game a little bit so it's simpler. There are less rules. Um, next is people who play the game of Portal. It's a really interesting and complicated puzzle kind of platformer game. Most people play it in first person. But if you play this, the two player version, it, there's this added layer of complexity where you're trying to show somebody where to shoot a portal at. Um, so even in split screen, um, if you and your, say, wife are trying to communicate on this, you're like, go oh, look at the ceiling. OK, it's there. But they, they kind of solve this with um, you can ping a location to uh, the other player, and they, they very easily can just look at it quickly. That, that icon is kind of change up there. That shows shows up, and it resolves basically disputes of I'm pointing at something. Can you just look at that and like make your own decision about whether you agree or don't agree? Which could be totally useful on uh, shuffleboard in the idea of like let's not get involved. Let's just let somebody ping a location and say, hey, this is an overhanging puck. I should get an extra point. 
and not try and track whether that actually is. Okay, cool. Um, the, big, the big idea here, can we go to the next, mm -hmm. is all of the exploration that's going on in shared, uh, shared augmented reality. So Facebook, Google, um, Snapchat are already exploring the space. Users are, uh, users are already using this stuff. Um, so can we come in and help explore that for augmented reality um, in terms of like, real space? Seems like there's an opportunity to help our partner Microsoft there and do it through like shared exploration that's uh, through all of our offices and connecting us up. That's basically it. And just, we don't really want to win. We haven't really uh, set up the concept that we want to go forward with it. But we want everybody to win and say, how can we all like make our projects go forward? Um, so more HoloLenses, more shared projects. Let's maybe store the HoloLens like in a multi-purpose cabinet that is the shuffleboard, so people are all coming to the same place physically and digitally. And uh, then let's take on the road for clients. They want this. Like, Allstate was a perfect example. Let's repeat the Allstate experience with shuffleboard, possibly, but definitely HoloLens because they're they're interested too, and we're a little ahead of the curve. So, questions? I think we're at time. So. Thank you. So last we have uh, Holloway, uh, one last presentation. I know we're slowly over one, but uh, uh, one last presentation to go through. Uh, he's going to go over some stuff. Uh, and I know he also mentioned that some of the client-related stuff, there are some client engagements actually in the works already regarding things. So um, it's also interesting to see that they're reaching out to utilize the Holloway for advice. So that's advice. Mm -hmm. Well, before, while we work to get that fixed, I will say a couple of things I've already learned and just, I'm up here again, it's me again, because I was so excited about HoloLens and also just about being from 53 and invited to participate in something down on 51. And I'm pretty sure if shuffleboards aren't being used, we should start like Friday morning coffee and shuffleboard tournaments where, you know, you can, no, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Already yeah. Get support. Perfect. So we're here. Uh, our first slide. Our first slide is dead. Uh, we're here to introduce to you Hollow Aid. So we've heard a lot about all the fun and amazing and also client relevant things that can be done with Hololens. We invite you to expand your mind to think about the humanitarian impact that we had from Hololens. We started off with an idea of, we want to help people with this amazing technology. Where do we even start? So the first thing that came to mind was disaster relief and AIDS. Uh, aid. And AIDS. No S. This is really throwing me off. I'm pretty loud. I feel like this is not going to be an issue. So 25.8 million people every year are affected by natural disasters. And just in 2014 and 2015, Ebola affected 27,000 people and had a death rate of over 41% in just six countries in West Africa. It's a huge need. Our hypothesis was we think that there could potentially be a skill gap between those people on the ground and the experts who are available to help in these types of situations. <clears throat> so, the first thing we did is say, hey, who on our team has ever helped out in any sort of disaster situation? And the answer was no one. So we had to go do some research. So we wanted to really understand if we're going to make something that's going to help individuals, what kind of help do they need? So we interviewed three public health professionals and an additional three disaster relief volunteers and they worked on everything from Ebola to Katrina to flood relief in Texas. And we listened to what they had to say, and we took their stories, and we said, all right, what are we hearing? We're hearing a lot about communication. People are just go, 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 go. And they're not necessarily thinking about how can we make order? How can we make sure there's consistent training, clear leadership? Sometimes we have people here who don't know what's safe. Uh, we, we don't have certain medical expertise that we need. And so we started seeing these patterns emerge. Chaos 
uh, is something that we can potentially help with because we know that there are people who know how to handle this type of situation. So how can we connect expertise with those in need using HoloLens? And that was really the problem. If anybody in this room is familiar with design thinking, that's really the how might we that we started to dig into. How might we use HoloLens to really help these people who are in dire situations? And so we started doing some more research. And this is where we really found our inspiration. So if we can hit play, you'll see a dad assisting his daughter from who knows where with how to fix pipes. He just has an iPad and she's wearing a hollow lens and all of a sudden his expertise is transported to wherever she is. We are also not super technical. We did have Senio on our team and he represented and helped us understand how some of this can be possible. Because of the complicated uh, solution that we came up with, we're just gonna walk you through a mock of what would, how this solution would be helpful. So I'm gonna introduce Karen McKay to show how that would happen. Hello, uh, so we wanted to walk through a couple different scenarios of how Holloway could be used. Uh, so we have our remote expert over on the left and then our HoloLens user on the ground, in the field, wherever the disaster, whatever the situation is, they're there on site. Um, so here we're looking at shelter construction and planning. So let's say you're setting up um, a refugee camp or uh, some sort of shelters because people have been displaced. So you have an expert that's able to say like, hey, we need something over here, let's move it over there. We need to make sure these pots are set up this way. And they're able to transfer that information from their home or their office or wherever they are to whoever it's on the ground. Something else that we heard about is sort of after some sort of disaster, trying to figure out if people's homes are safe to go back to. Um, and that requires some expert knowledge. So maybe you have somebody who has that knowledge in that area and the person there can be wear the HoloLens, go into the homes and have somebody letting them know like we need to look out for this, this structure doesn't look safe anymore, there's mold here, um, you know, we're seeing leaks and just having that knowledge transferred to them on the ground. One of the specific things about HoloLens for this example is the object permanence. So instead of having one conversation where we've walked through a house and I called out eight different things that you need to pay attention to, it's like when you're buying a home and everybody goes through the inspection and they tell you all these things and you're like, oh God, I hope I remember that later, how to fix all of these. Now you can just put the HoloLens back on and the next individual who comes back in will have the same experience the same expert guidance showing them what to do yeah and you're able to record it and keep it for for records or for future reference or it's nice to have that knowledge collected and saved um, and then another scenario is what about medical situations or triage um, so here you know we have people that are helping this woman but maybe you know they've also been affected by this earthquake and they also need to be checked out so the expert who is able to be in a little bit more of a calm space and just sort of viewing the situation um, can really help the person on the ground with a little bit more rational, logical perspective and make sure that nothing gets missed and that we're able to give good care to everybody who's there and who's affected. So you can see nothing like hollow aid is in use today. And this connection between individuals with the expertise, with the subject matter, expertise can come in, whether they're doctors, aid workers, nurses, um, and they can really, instead of flying all these people in for maybe 24 hours and hoping that that message gets cascaded down, we now can have two to three hollow lenses on the ground and you can use them for training, for guidance. Uh, you can have recorded sessions that now outlive the stance of somebody being there. So we really think that there's a, a huge potential for positive impact. But we're not all sunshines and rainbows, and we understand that there are some major potential barriers to adoption. So in a disaster area, there's not always wireless. In third world countries, there may not be the same access to internet and power sources, especially in these types of situations. It was mentioned a couple of times earlier, HoloLenses are expensive. How do you make sure that they're kept safe and secure in these types of chaotic environments? 
And how do we even get HoloLens to these individuals that need them? So our team took some time to uh, think through some potential solutions. These are just starting point solutions. The cool thing about the HoloLens, the cool thing about this hackathon is we're at the very beginning of where all of these projects can go. We really hope that we intrigue some awesome talent from 51 that wants to help us build this out further following this presentation. But we thought maybe for wireless, all the work Facebook's doing around satellites. Could something along that path be utilized uh, to get internet to these types of devices? Could we use solar power? Maybe you build a solar power case that helps to charge the hollow lenses. That same case can have added levels of security to make sure that it's always on the lockdown when it's not being used. We initially thought, hey, let's just drone fly in these things. And then we thought, we don't need to. Donations and supplies are getting to these areas a lot of times in large uh, quantities. We need to make sure that uh, you know, the HoloLens is sent and is easy to get to. Maybe they sit at the embassies of areas that are prone to these large national disasters. Or we, we have partnerships with the Red Cross or the Gates Foundation that can help us make sure that these uh, devices and this type of connection is being made. So you just saw three incredibly valuable but fairly simple ways that this could be used. In the 2.0, 3.0 version evolutions of Hollow Aid, could you actually have CPR training uh, where you know if the Hollow Aid shows you exactly where on a human body uh, you need to perform certain medical tasks? Could you have fully training, fully recorded training sessions that an individual could just wear as a volunteer that would help ensure consistent processes and practices in the volunteer space? When we are performing triage and medical services, could it snap a picture of the individual that you saw? And then it's documented of, we said that, you know, Amy McGinnis was critical. She was sweating, she, she was probably turning red. It looked like she may have been very nervous. And it's just documented forever. You'll have a process of where you're going and what, you, what, what happened. So we showed you on our example, somebody drawing uh, with an arrow of the, in the middle of kind of the shelter. What if you just had a blank gymnasium? You said, I need to turn this into somewhere for 300 people to sleep. Could you actually have the boxes to lay out so anybody who put it on could see exactly how much space to leave between aisles, where to put waste management? And I'm out of time, so I'm not going to introduce the coordination of drones. Uh, but it's such a cool idea. Come talk to me afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Um, so I know there's been a lot of how can we use this with clients and we decided to sort of just put a little bit of a different spin on that and just talk about, you know, be really quick, talk about how we think this project really aligns with Slalom's values and who we are. Um, that this project is a lot about helping other people and helping people get what they need, live good lives, um, inspiring passion and adventure. Um, so we just think this is something that really speaks to who we are here at Slalom. Um, and Amy mentioned this a little bit, but the idea of how could we get this out into the world? How could other people be using this on the ground? And these are just a couple different partners that we thought would be great to work with um, to, to get this out in the world and have them using it on site. You know, all of these people are working on different disaster relief situations. We learned a lot. This is us. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to say, even though we didn't have uh, developers, we did really think it was cool that we had people from different practices working together on this. Um, and it was just, we were coming from a different perspective, but we're happy where we landed. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I know we're a little over time, but uh, thanks for everyone for showing up. Uh, thanks for the judges as well. Uh, without them, we wouldn't have anyone to bribe. So uh, I think we'll get those stuff in order sometime in the near future today, and we'll figure out who technically won. As far as the next steps, there is uh, Boston, uh, Toronto, and Houston also competing in the coming months. Uh, there is a site, info, slalom, at Hackathon, or something like that. Um, and then in February, all the finalists compete, and someone wins, and then uh, they get to be super cool, like the Foodles team. So hopefully Chicago will take it twice. Uh, that being said, uh, if you're ever interested in uh, being a part of a hackathon going forward, uh, next year we're looking for opportunities and, and thoughts. So if you're interested in trying to host one, 
or have any cool ideas, let us know. Uh, let me know. Let Tim Knapp know. Let, let Andy know. He, he's interested. So, um, As far as who all helped put this together, uh, John Busby, you saw him speak in the beginning. That's me um, here, who was, uh, pretty or uh, helped orchestrate a lot of stuff going on while I was out for a week. And then Alicia as well made those beautiful pamphlets that will live on. Um, as far as getting everything together, we're here made sure to get everyone's presentations and videos together. Those can be accessed afterward if need be, and the live stream is also recorded. So um, we have Jeremiah over in Seattle who help orchestrate everything from like a top-down perspective across all the different markets. We got Madi and Ryan on a bit of the a uh, little bit of local ops side, setting up the room and doing our live stream up here. And then uh, ops helped getting all these devices around all the different markets, uh, getting stuff set up. I know we have Noodles and Company in the corner, um, so all these people here. So thank you very much to everyone on this board here, and thanks again to the judges, and then the teams as well. This can't happen without people actually participating. It'd be, this would be sad if, uh, <laughs> if nobody was up here for an hour. So uh, thank you very much. Round of, uh, round of applause for all the teams again. Between the two hall lenses, we have two working applications on each. Uh, I need to find that up you see that where you are. You gotta unlock the other one. But yeah, once we do that, if you guys wanna stick around, help us clean up a bit though first, because otherwise everyone will be running over all the chairs and that won't be fun for you. So once we do that, I guess the atrium is free space. Uh, people can try out all the demos and stuff um, to the end of the day. Yeah. Cool, thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Yeah.